Uh, hello, is that Paul? It is Robert. Yeah, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Um, yes, Good. keep keeping okay, thank you. And yourself? Good. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. We've had two weddings and a funeral in the last six weeks and we're moving a house. Oh. So it's an uh, extremely stressful and busy time. Yes. Would it be more convenient to speak some other time if you're very busy at the moment? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually only a brief call because I've actually got a headache. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions for you, actually. Yes, OK. I... Why don't I just answer your questions? Just one thing before we start. The the lady I spoke to, that was your daughter last week. She wasn't a child, was she? She was an adult. Yes, she just got married. Yes, yeah. that, so that's the daughter that was mad. It wasn't another daughter, a younger child. No, okay. no. Because okay. no. I don't like speaking to, to, to children. OK, fire away with your questions, and maybe yeah. we'll yeah. speak at length some other time when you're feeling yeah. better. Have, have you studied or been a Jehovah's Witness? I've never been a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I used to be um, an evangelical Christian, but I stopped going about 10 years ago. I did go through the first four chapters of what can the Bible, no, what does the Bible really teach uh, more than 10 years ago. But I was told that um, they couldn't continue with me because I was a Trinitarian, so it wasn't wasn't suitable for me. Right, OK. All right. Um, OK, that, that does help. Um, I have met, because, I mean, you, I, uh, there was a couple of times the way that you responded to us, we didn't think was just, uh, very kindly, actually. Um, and I hope you felt that we were actually very kind in the way that we spoke to you. OK. Um, I only met one other individual in 30 years of doing the ministry that has viewed the Trinity in the same way as you. Um, okay. I, I take a standard um, view of the Trinity as defined in the creeds. Yeah. I do no, simplify what? it. I do simplify it because if you use the creedal language, it comes across as yeah. very uh, confusing. No, 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 but, but that would justify why we were uh, trying to understand your view of the Trinity, because you were saying there was only one view. That, that might be on a technical matter, but when we speak to various individuals... There is various theories of what the Trinity is, and we were trying to understand yours. Now, as I say, in all my years, I've only... <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking outside, and uh, there was nearly an accident. Um, oh. I've only met one other individual that views it the same way as you. And I find it very difficult to reason with somebody like you, for, because uh, on one way you say... They are, the three are one, and another way you say the three are not one. And it's very, very difficult to actually reason with a Trinitarian, um, with your views. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Um, yes. Um, firstly, I left the church because of the scandals in the churches 10 years ago, but also because of the Trinity. I found that when I went to evangelical churches, um, most of the people that I was mixing with, Pentecostal, Charismatic and Baptist types, just made it up as they went along. Um, the Trinity is a very clearly, very accurately, very precisely defined doctrine. There aren't um, uh, different views of the Trinity. There's a slight disagreement between the Western Church and the Eastern Church. The Western Church talks about a dual procession of the Holy Spirit from both the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church uh, talks about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son. And I've actually taken the position of the Eastern Church. But apart from that, um, it's all very clearly and accurately defined. The trouble is that most people who go to so-called Trinitarian churches don't know what the Trinity is. So when you ask them what is the Trinity, they just make it up on the spur of the moment. And because they don't know what they're talking about... When you speak to five or six different people who go to evangelical churches, you're going to get five and six radically different definitions because most of these people, in my opinion, don't know what they're talking about. That's why I left. I considered it in the end to be a total waste of my time going to these churches. What's the point? When I actually do know what I've, I'm talking about. I, I, don't, 
don't, I don't um, have, have an issue with what you're saying, Robert. I, I clearly understand why you've separated yourself. From my, from my viewpoint, um, it, it was not a doctrine that Jesus or the apostles actually believed in, and it was brought in in the third century. But, now, but hold on, hold on. Everyone's belief was brought in in the third century. You no, see, I, I, no, I, hold I, on. I let, let me just. Obviously, Jesus and the apostles taught the truth, yes? Yes. Right. But two or three centuries after Jesus, two centuries after Jesus, different beliefs arose. One belief was the Gnostic belief, or well, that, that, that was existent in, in actual, in the later epistles of the New Testament. Then, out of Gnosticism, you had various different beliefs. You had an early view of people who became Arians, who believed the father was the God, the, the, the number one God, and Jesus was like a number two lesser God. Then you had modalists. Modalists were people who believed that Jesus was the father. So when Jesus is praying to the father, he's praying to himself because the father, son and Holy Spirit are all the same person because God's just one person in different modes. That's modalism or sibelianism. And then you had a third group who would be believe that there is one God, but that one God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they, they are the Trinitarians. So all of these different beliefs arose in the, in the second century, second, third century. As was foretold in the Bible that the, the, um, the apostasy would, would come forth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I totally, I, I totally accept that. Yeah. But everyone's belief was defined by creeds, not just the Trinitarian. The, the Arians had their creeds. Um, the Modalists had their creeds. And there were many other groups. It was a m lot more subtle than that. Um, it wasn't just those three groups, the Arians, the Modalists, and the Trinitarians. You had other groups. Um, another group were the Adoptionists, who seemed to be between Arius and between the Trinitarians, because they would say Jesus is God, but he wasn't born the God. He, he was born a man, but he became God at his baptism. So God adopted him in, into the Godhead at his baptism. All of these beliefs started to be promulgated in the second and third century. So what you then have later would be church councils responding to this. Well, well I, I agree, but it was wrong. <laughs> well, well, everyone did, 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 did this. I mean, there was a time in the church... Um, when most of the people in the church held a position similar to yours. They were Arians. The Trinitarians were the minority. And if it wasn't for Athanasius, Trinitarianism might have died out completely if it wasn't for Athanasius uh, and a few others like him. But um, you can't point the finger and say Trinitarian creeds are non-biblical. They're not in the Bible, which is completely true. When your own group, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, has its own doctrinal statements of faith. And so does every other group. So do the Mormons. So do the Seventh-day Adventists. So does the Way International. Uh, I, I, everyone's, I, 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 every, yeah, everyone yeah, no, does, I, does, no, does I, that. I, I, I take that. I take that. But what we would say is, don't forget, the only, uh, only the scriptures are inspired. So we've got of to course, make sure... Of course, that, of course, that, of course. ...that, that yeah. any doctrines are based clearly on the scriptures. Of course. And that's, and of course. That's what we go to. All right, so it's, it's pointless talking about the creeds of the 3rd and 4th century. It's irrelevant. It's a case of what does the Bible say? We've got to obey what the Bible says. Yeah. yeah. Right, but here's, here's my, my problem. Most people you speak to today, right, in the evangelical church, don't know what the Bible says, and they don't know what their own church creeds say, and they don't know what their own church doctrinal statements of faith say. They want to be the pastor because they got the free house, they've got the free car, they've got the pension, and they've promoted their son to be their number two pastor after them. And he's going to take over and have the free house and the free car and the pension after them. So for many of these people, I think the motivation is financial. I don't think it's, it's fidelity to God at all. It's, 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 a, it's a business. And I, I accept that. Well. And, and, I, and I, whereas years ago, and to some extent today, if you want to become an Anglican, You've got to go to Oxford or Cambridge, get a first class honours degree or maybe from another university and then get your doctorate. It's very hard work to get a first class honours degree and then to get a doctorate after that. But 
In some churches, Methodist and but certainly the Anglican church, that's what's expected of you. But if you go to a Billy Bob Joe evangelical church, you don't even need to read the Bible through once. You just stand up and say, ah, I've got a message from God. The Lord is speaking to me now. The Lord is telling me this. And the Lord's always speaking to these people all the time. Because they don't have a clue as to what the Bible says. That's why I left the evangelical church. I think it's the worst of all of them. If I ever went back, I'd probably go to an Anglican church. Not because I think the Anglican church is very good. I think it's pretty useless. But at least some people in the Anglican church do actually know what they're talking about. You can sit down and have a conversation with them. You can't with an evangelical. They'll just get angry. And, you know, they might call the police and say you're threatening them or harassing them or using racist language or something. Even though I'm speaking as I'm speaking to you now politely, they can't discuss the Bible because they don't know it. They make it up as they go along. So if you want to discuss the Trinity, what do you what are you talking about? Are you talking about the ancient creeds of the church or are you are, or do you want me to discuss? Right. Okay. It's, yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about. Okay. It at all. Okay. Fine. Fine. But what, but, but what I would uh, as, say to you, it, it, for me, listening to you, you are hundred percent convinced that the Trinity is correct. Well, I'm I'm fifty nine. I've been discussing the Bible. I came out of oneness, which is modalism. No, 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 sorry, no, sorry, sorry. Can, can you answer that question? Are you hundred percent convinced that the Trinity is correct? Is a biblical doctrine? Um, I don't think the language is, is pretty, pretty accurate. Three persons, the word person has changed its meaning over time. So it's a pretty inaccurate term today when you talk about person. Um, there's aspects of Trinitarian doctrine, which is disputable, which is disputed. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from both the Father and the Son, a dual procession, which is called filioque, or is there a single procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son, as taught in the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox churches? I would lean in that direction myself. But no, these things are disputed. These things are disputed. And I wouldn't say I'm, I can say with absolute certainty that I know absolutely the position that I hold to is correct. I hope it's correct. But I might meet someone who's a lot cleverer and a lot more knowledgeable than me and can say, actually, Robert, look at this and look at this and look at this, and they can point me in the right direction. Um, yeah, it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing to do with being clever. It's, it's, it's having the right heart condition to be open into the understanding of the scriptures. Yeah, because but that's what everyone it, says. Everyone who's a Mormon tells you your heart must be humble. Your heart must be humble to see that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. You need to be baptized in the Mormon church. You need to go through the temple. You need to become a Melchizedek priest in the Mormon church. And then you speak to a Christadelphian and they tell you your heart must be humble. Be Have a humble heart and you can see Christadelphian doctrine is true. Trinity's wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. The Mormons are wrong. But the Christadelphians are true. There are thousands of little groups, Paul, who will tell you that they are true and when they talk about a heart condition it's because they don't want to discuss the bible they can't discuss the bible they want to talk about emotional touchy feely things because they can't deal with scripture because scripture yeah, doesn't harmonize with their beliefs yeah don't include us in that group why because we strongly follow the scriptures well it's got to be it's got to be strongly following the scriptures and have the right heart condition. You can't have one without the other. I think that you... So you've, got to know, you've got to know the Bible. I think you actually follow your leaders, not the scriptures. I mean, the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses change radically every few years. When you have new dictates from your governing body in the Watchtower literature, you used to teach... Um, that Jesus Christ became the almighty God at his resurrection, which is very similar. Remember at the start of our discussion, I talked it about the heresy of adoptionism. It, now, that's in it, your it, book. That's in several of it, your books and watchtowers. I can't quote it, them all from... It, can I finish? It takes, yeah, no, it takes humility to accept that, you, uh, that you've actually had something wrong in the past. And then you're going to correct it because it was wrong understanding. You, you, you know our, our history. I mean, could I? There's been so much 
there's been several changes and they've been for the better. They've been the correct understanding has come forward. And I would rather go with an organisation that's willing to humbly admit mistakes and move forward. Uh, they don't admit, admit the mistakes. Idea. They don't admit mistakes. People they have admitted mistakes. No, people are disfellowshipped and they are told that they can't speak to their own family members because they don't agree with Watchtower Doctrine. And then, years later, Watchtower Doctrine changes, and the person who's disfellowshipped, he was right after all, but he's still disfellowshipped. <laughs> no one apologises to him. There are no apologies. And the, the literature I was referring to was the Berean Bible Teacher's Manual, page 454, which talks about Jesus Christ becoming the Almighty God at his resurrection. That's what you used to, t to teach. And when you claim that Jesus did an inspection and a cleansing work between 1914 and 1919, and then he chose the Watchtower Society as, as his representative on earth in 1919, that's what you were teaching at the time. That's the truth you were teaching at the time, that Christ becomes the almighty God at his resurrection. And up until 1953, it was changed in the 1st of January, 1954, Watchtower, you worship both Jehovah God and uh, the, 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 you worship both the Father and Jesus Christ. But in, on the 1st of January 1954, you did away with the worship of Jesus. These are changes, but not necessarily yeah. for the better. Uh, if, if you're unwilling to accept that we as Jehovah's Witnesses will make changes when we get a correct understanding, then obviously this religion isn't for you. I, I, I believe it's the right religion, and I accept the, um, the changes that they've made, and I understand why they've made the changes. But if you're going to um, go back on history and be critical because of that, I, I don't think we can go anywhere with our conversations. But, but you do the same. Your literature constantly points to the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition, to the tortures that the Roman Catholics performed during the Spanish Inquisition, burning people at the stake, torturing people in dungeons. Uh, the Catholics signing the Concordat with Nazi Germany in 1934, was it 33 or 34, when von Papen, uh, the former Chancellor of Germany, representing the Third Reich, signed on behalf of Hitler, and then Cardinal Pacelli, who became Pope Paul VI, signed on behalf of, was it Pope Paul VI, or was it the one who became Pope, Pope I forget, one of, but one of the Popes signed on on. What one of the cardinals who became pope later signed on behalf of um, Pope Pius. Um, you constantly criticise other religions, but it's not a two-way discussion, Paul. Yeah, listen. Yeah, I mean, for instance, another thing is you claim that Jesus chose the Watchtower Society in nineteen nineteen. Yes. That's when the theocracy, you claim Jesus became king in 1914. You are aware yeah. that you used to teach he became king in 1878. That's in Studies in the Scripture, Volume 4, page 604. No, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I'm very, very in mind, I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness until the 80s. And I haven't referred back to that history because that's irrelevant. But it's not irrelevant because either Jesus did choose the Watchtower Society in 1919 or it's all complete bunkum. Did Jesus choose the Watchtower Society as his sole representative on earth in 1919? Yes or no? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Robert, but you, you, you've come to me initially with a query, OK, um, in, the, in the email. It doesn't appear to me that you really wanted an answer to that email, and you seem to be very adamant in your opinions. And it it I, I is not think, my opinion. Think, it's I, the I, teaching I, of the Watchtower Society, Paul, that, no, God, that no, Jehovah no, sorry, God... No, 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 so, so, Robert, I really don't feel that we're going to get anywhere with any conversations. I honestly just don't feel it's worth it. Paul, I, Paul, I just, the sorry, Watchtower really Society sorry. claims that it was chosen... It, Jesus did a cleansing and an inspection work between 1914 yeah. and 1919. He chose the Watchtower Society in 1919. That's not what I claim. I don't. I don't no, believe that. No, I, That's I, what the Watchtower I, claims. I I have said to you in the past, okay, the Watchtower's not inspired. The Bible. Well, then why do I have to listen to it? 
we, if it's we, not we, inspired, why do I have to listen to a prophet that's not inspired? That's that's nonsense. I don't listen to Joseph Smith of the Mormons. I don't waste my time with the Mormons or Pastor Billy Bob Joe of some local happy clappy Pentecostal church. I avoid these people because they don't know what they're talking about. They claim that they're inspired, but they're not inspired because they, d they don't even know what they're talking about. When you say you agree the Watchtower Society is not inspired, why do I have to listen to a prophet that's not inspired when I've got the Bible, which is inspired? As, as, as I said, Robert, you, you've got very strong opinions, which I don't have an issue with that because I think it's good to have that opinion. But I don't feel that you're really going to give me an opportunity and really listen to what I've got to say. I think we've really just got to agree to differ. I really don't feel the conversation's going anywhere. I'm, re I'm really sorry, Robert. I'm willing to listen if to I, you, Paul. If, 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 I, if, I, if I'm wrong, I do apologise, but that's the way I actually feel. Would there be somebody else at Southampton who I can speak to? I would go, so if you want to speak to someone, go to somebody locally in Plymouth. No one answers the phone. No one answers the phone. Well, the, the, the problem is because no one's at the King of Halls at, at the moment. But you, uh, all I would say to you, Robert, because you don't appear to um, have an open mind when you're actually having the conversation. You appear to be fixed in, in your opinion. And, and it's only worth the conversation if you can be open-minded. Um, but you, you'd have to go to someone locally if, if, if that's the case. I'm sorry if I got it wrong, but that's uh, that's the way it's coming across to me. Uh, um, I do wish you, I do wish you all the best, Robert. You know, I've, uh, I've got a quote here. The establishment of the theocracy as a separate nation is here stated as beginning in 1919, when additionally a separation of true Christians from false Christians consequently took place. That's the Watchtower. 15th of January 1994, pages 14 and 15, paragraph 21. Isn't that saying that the theocracy started in the year 1919 and that the Jehovah's Witnesses are the true Christians who are a part of this theocracy with every other religious and political group being outside of this theocracy? But of course there can only be one true religion, can't there? You and I know that. But the Watchtower is saying that it is that theocracy, isn't it? Of course we believe we have the uh, correct religion, yes. Then wouldn't it be wise of me to check your history to see how truthful you've been in the past, to see if what they have said has come true? Because that's how you tell a true prophet from a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18, uh -huh. 20 to 22 says, false prophets make false prophecies, but true prophets make true prophecies. Now, in 1919, Rutherford was preaching his sermon. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not very well. Um, Millions now living will never die. That He started that sermon series in 1918. Um, working from his, his sermon, he published that as a book in 1920, but it's based on the sermon given in 1918. And in that book, Millions Now Living Will Never Die, which I've got, he says on page 88 that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob would rise from the dead in 1925. Now, that's a false prophecy, isn't it? It's wrong understanding. He's never claimed to be a prophet, has he? It's wrong understanding at the time, and it's been corrected, and, and, and I don't have an issue with that. But if you have an issue with that, that's, a, that, that's the issue. That's what I'm saying. Um, we, we, it's just our conversations aren't going to go anywhere. So, um, but if you're feeling very well and I've got a headache, I think we'll All right. finish it there. Okay, okay Paul. Okay. Th thank you very much. Would you be able to pass my details on to somebody else to help me? Please. Uh, I actually don't know anybody. Uh, so whereabouts, in, uh, whereabouts are you living? I live in Plymouth. You can, you, if you can you pass my details on to somebody else, that would, that, that would be great. OK, thank you. All right, then. Bye, Robert. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.